$1,500 so far um, that will be donated to various ministries in our church. So um, thank you so much. Thank you, Pat, and all you girls all that, that worked so hard yesterday in setting up tables and thank those. Pat for organizing it. Yes, thank you, Pat, for, for all that <clears throat> that you do and for all you, even those that baked all the goodies. I, uh, I, Okay, thank you so much. And yes. Thank you, and we're glad Verna Beachley just walked in, <laughs> and we're glad you, you're back here with us. I know she had a test this week, too, and all is well. It's in God's hands. Thank you. Any uh, other announcements? Also, um, I want to remember, <clears throat> remind you, maybe uh, you haven't heard, but Chuck Allen, another, uh, he and his wife are always here on Sundays, but he had a mild heart attack. But he's home now, too, I believe, and doing well. So keep Chuck Allen in your prayers. And then uh, Sally Swedberg will be having some surgery sometime in the middle of this week, too. So keep her in your prayers. Any other announcements or prayer requests? Okay, good. We'll keep this all in mind. <clears throat> and keep it in your prayers. Okay. I also want to remind you, especially to remember those of you who are on the board, we have a church board meeting tomorrow, tomorrow night. <clears throat> Keep that in mind at 7. And also there's a community meal at Zion Lutheran tomorrow night. <clears throat> and any other announcements? Yes. Steve. Okay, thank you so much. That's at Faith Lutheran and Walker. Okay, should be a great time, good concert, and for a good cause. Any other announcements? This is good. Thank you so much. Okay, then let's just go to the Lord in prayer at this time and ask for his blessing on our gathering this morning. Heavenly Father, we are truly thankful for your goodness to us as we think that our health is something we, we cannot buy, but we know that you give it to us, Lord, as a free gift. We thank you for the health and strength that you've given each one of us here this morning and bringing us here to worship you, to lift you up, and thank you for health and strength and all the other blessings that you bestow upon us. We love you this morning, Lord, and we want to show that in our worship as we worship you through song and praise. We ask this in your name. Amen. Okay, let's then sing together, His Name is Jesus. His Name is Jesus. 
His name is Jesus, Jesus. Sad hearts weep no more. He has healed the brokenhearted, opened wide the prison doors. He is able to deliver evermore. His name is Jesus. stand and uh, welcome those who are worshiping with us here this morning. We're glad you're here and give them a good welcome. <laughs> together then a thousand candles <laughs> to have with us again this morning, <coughs> Ryan O'Leary, and he's going to come with our pastoral prayer at this time. Glad you're here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 
I'll try third one's a charm. There we go. <laughs> we got it on. Uh, we have a bunch of different prayer requests. I want to welcome everyone this morning. Hope everyone's having a, a great Christmas season so far. Uh, beautiful weather here, right, so far this time of the year, unless you really love snow. Um, but uh, I've been enjoying this weather, milder weather. Um, let's go into our prayer time right now. It's a bunch of different prayer requests uh, to bring before the Lord. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, I just uh, want to lift up uh, some of these different requests to you today. Uh, I pray for Lorraine's dad, Bob, who has broken his leg. And uh, God, we just pray that you would really minister to him. We pray that you would surround him with other people who just deeply love him, to be an encouragement to him uh, in this time of difficulty that he is going through. And Lord, I just pray that he would walk in your truth, the truth of your word and the truth of what you say about him and how much you love him. So I pray, though, that you, he'd be aware of that more and more, uh, just the love that you have for him and your care for him in this difficult time. Uh, I just pray for Jewel as well, who's uh, had surgery. We just pray for healing in her body. We pray for a good recovery. Lord, we just pray for, in the season, Lord, where we talk about peace and joy so often, we pray that that would be a reality in her life, that you would just help her to have great peace and joy uh, in the midst of this as well as she recovers. I also want to pray for Chuck Allen, who had a mild heart attack. Uh, Lord, we just look to you, Lord, as a great physician, the one who can heal us, and how you use doctors in that. And so we uh, pray for Chuck today. We ask that you would give the doctors and medical staff really good wisdom and guidance as, as, he, as they treat him and as he recovers from this mild heart attack. We pray, Lord, just for your healing hand to be upon him as well. And Lord, we just pray that uh, you would just draw him closer to you, that he have a deeper walk with you, a deeper relationship with you and, uh, during this difficult time of his life and as he recovers from this. I also want to pray for Verna today, Lord, who is going through different tests. Lord, when we go through times of tests and uncertainty, Lord, I know that can make us anxious and uncertain about what the future holds. And so, Lord, we just pray for your peace, the peace of Christ to rule in her heart. And I pray for that um, for her husband as well. I pray for doctors that you would give them wisdom uh, to determine what's going on. And pray for a quick resolution to the situation, God. And uh, that you would be glorified in the midst of what they're going through, um, through their lives and the way they live their lives in general. I also want to pray for Sally Swedberg today, uh, who has surgery this week. Lord, we also want to pray for peace for her as well as she prepares for this. We just pray that um, the doctor would be guided by you through this process. Uh, we, Lord, we just pray that you would help her to be a great Christian witness to others around her during this time, to doctors and medical staff and to everyone else. Lord, I just uh, pray for all the other needs in this church. Uh, Lord, we pray that you meet the financial needs of this church. We pray, Lord, that this congregation would just consistently draw closer to you and, and to be made more in the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Each one of us would be more, made more in the image of your son, Jesus Christ. That we would grow spiritually. Uh, I want to pray for the Black Duck community, God. We pray that people would come to know you, that people, people would be saved in this community. community. Uh, be saved from, from sin and enter into an eternal relationship with you. And Lord, so I just pray for the work of your Holy Spirit in this community. And I pray, Lord, that you continue to use Black Duck Church, Lord, to be a light and salt in this community, God, in a mighty and just a powerful way, that you'd increase the witness of this church um, uh, in this day and age as well. And let me lift all these things up to you. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, Amen. <clears throat> Sing it out loud. <clears throat> Our herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful.
coming in this way, coming as a babe in a manger, humbly in a manger with cattle lowing. <clears throat> Thank you for coming in this manner as a babe and then living an example for us for 33 years, how to live the Christian life. And then the only one who knew no sin, God's son, died in our place. Thank you for this great gospel story and the truth. And we believe it, Lord. We know it for sure. Because then when you left, you left your spirit to live within our hearts. So we are a temple of yours, Lord. We're glad that you live within us in our heart. But it all began with Christmas season. So we thank you for this. May we never forget it, Lord. Thank you again and again. Thank you for the blessings, Lord, too, that we we have that you give to us, family, friends, financial, our job, all these blessings, health and strength. Lord, we just ask now, Lord, as we give back a portion of what you've blessed us with, that you'll bless the missions it supports, bless those who cannot give at this time too, Lord, we pray in your precious name with thanks. Amen. <laughs> And if you're able, we'll just stand as we sing. Then again, another good Christmas song. <clears throat> All shepherds watch their flocks. I know you can sing better when you're standing, right? <laughs> sing. All shepherds watch their flocks by night. Scripture reading for this morning. Thank you. <clears throat> the scripture reading this morning is Romans um, 1, 1 through 7. I will be reading from the New American Standard. Um, you can find this on page 1126. Um, if you haven't brought your own Bibles with you and want to follow along. <clears throat> One through seven is just a very, very long sentence. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are called of, Christ, of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, 
grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's uh, bow our heads in uh, a word of prayer as we go into God's word. Lord, in the midst of this busy season that we're in, we often don't take time to stop and pause and just uh, reflect on what you did for us, Lord, some of the times we had one of the reasons. So we ask you for it. We just give you glory and thanks. Lord, we thank you for the work of the Spirit that lives in us as believers in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I just pray that your Spirit would just guide and lead you as we speak today. People, I pray that your spirit is at work in hearts and lives. We welcome you to do a work in our lives. Uh, speak to our hearts so that we can uh, walk with you as we close our minds in your word. And uh, we would have much to do today. We give you this blessed time today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. <clears throat> well, it's Christmas season, and as I think about that phrase, uh, I think about my own childhood and why Christmas often involves putting up the Christmas tree, opening gifts, uh, being part of the food. Uh, not only that, uh, playing hockey outside after we got to eat food. And being that I grew up in a Christian family, being that I grew up in a Christian family, uh, going to church and celebrating the birth of Jesus. But Christmas is one of those times of the year where we're, we're often going through a variety of circumstances and dealing with a variety uh, of things. And uh, that includes singing some Christmas carols. Uh, I like this story, a little short story about a, a little boy and girl. They were singing one of their favorite Christmas carols during church one Sunday before Christmas. And it's interesting sometimes how kids can put their own little spin on things about how they say things in Christmas carols. And uh, this boy concluded Silent Night with the words, Sleep in Heavenly Beans, as in baked beans. And his little sister whispered to him and said, uh, It's not beans, it's, it's peas, as, as in peas in the pod. <laughs> Rather than Prince of Peace. And so for others, Christmas is a time of struggle. Uh, people may be struggling in different ways. It's interesting that the American Psychological Association, they found that 38% of people felt their stress levels increased during the holiday season. And people struggle maybe more with things like depression and anxiety. So it's a struggle sometimes to be in the holiday season. And Christmas is also a time where we give material gifts. But I love what uh, Pastor Chuck Swindoll said uh, about material gifts. And how there's even some, some ways that we can give that are better than even material gifts. He says this. He says, some gifts you can give this Christmas are beyond monetary value. He said, mend a quarrel. Dismiss suspicion. Tell someone, I love you. Give something away anonymously. Forgive someone who has treated you wrong. Turn away wrath with a soft answer. Visit someone in a nursing home. Apologize if you're wrong. Be especially kind to someone you work with. And give just as Christ gave to you without obligation, announcement, reservation, or hypocrisy. But in the midst of this Christmas season, one of the things that we often fail to do is take time to reflect. And to reflect on what Jesus did for us, but not only that, to just reflect on our own lives and to ask ourselves, how are each of us doing spiritually in this Christmas season? Jesus said in John chapter 10, these words, he says, the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy, but that I have come so that you might li have life and have life abundantly. That's what Christmas is about. Jesus coming into this world. But it's for this purpose, so that each one of us can live an abundant life in Jesus Christ. And so the question is, what does that look like to live this abundant life? I want to read this passage of Scripture again uh, in Romans chapter 1, 1 through 7. It's great to, again to read God's Word again, so I want to read it again. As I think this passage shares three things about what abundant lo living looks like, not in our own eyes, but in God's eyes. Listen to what it says. 
Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Regarding his son, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Tall in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. A number of years ago, uh, I met a man by the name of James. And when James was young, he got involved in some sinful and illegal things and eventually found himself in prison. And when he was in prison, a follower of Christ came in and shared the gospel and James got saved. And he began growing spiritually. He, he began praying a lot. He began going to Bible study regularly and he began reading the Bible by himself. And God was giving him the passion, his passion to go back home after he got out of prison and to make a difference for the Lord in his home community. So James, he went back home after he got out of prison, and, and he was bold and standing up for the Lord. He was sharing, sharing the gospel, and people were saying things like, James, why, why, why are you so different? You've changed so much. And the reason was because Christ had came into his life. I met James at a, a ministry training event down in Arkansas many years ago, and one night after all the events were over, James and I, we, we stayed up late and we talked. He shared a little bit about what Christ had done in his life and what God was calling him to do. And then after that event, I went back to South Minneapolis where I was pastoring and James went back home to northern Minnesota. He got engaged and he moved down to the Twin Cities to make money for his wedding. And one Sunday morning, he came walking up the sidewalk to where I was pastoring and I walked up to him, I shook his hand, he shook my hand, we greeted each other. And he went in and he attended the church service that Sunday morning. And afterwards, we were having a picnic down at Lake Nokomis Park, right by the Minneapolis airport. And James came down. And he asked me if I would baptize him. I knew that he was a believer in Jesus, and so I knew he was ready, and so that I said that I would. And I can remember walking out into Lake Nokomis, we turned around and he shared his story. I shared a little bit and then I baptized him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And James came up out of the water full of joy, praising the Lord. About a month after that, I got a call from a, man, a friend, a ministry leader. And he said, did you hear what happened last night? And he said, no, what? He said, James passed away, died. He was stabbed. And in his apartment building, watching some of his relatives sleeping late at night, some of his young relatives he managed to make it out of the apartment and they rushed him to the hospital, Hennepin County Medical Center. And on the way to the hospital, he was crying out. He was saying, Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me. And he died on that hospital operating table. He went home to be with the Lord. But James went from living a dysfunctional life to living what I'm talking about this morning, and that being an abundant life. And this morning, you may want to know, well, what does this kind of life look like? I want to share three things with you this morning, what I think abundant living looks like from Romans chapter 1, if you'll take a look at this passage. And the first thing I want to share with you is, is just being and growing and being a constant servant of Christ. When we are serving Christ, we are living an abundant life. Uh, the entire book of Romans starts with these words, Paul, a servant or a bond servant of Christ Jesus, depending on what version you're reading. That word can actually be translated as slave. One of the things that I often wonder is, what does it look like to be a servant of God? What, what did Paul's life look like that showed that he was a true servant of God himself? Because if we can have a better understanding of what that kind of life looks like, then we can serve God ourselves and we can help others serve the Lord as well. And so I did, uh, I did some work on this recently. I, I took a look at the book of Acts to note just all the ways that Paul showed that he was a servant of God. And what I want to do this morning is I want to just give you some specific words uh, to highlight 
uh, to highlight this. And the first word that I want to give you is the word conversion. Conversion. Paul had a conversion to the person of Jesus Christ. And I say any person that is a servant of God has a conversion to Jesus Christ. You know the story in Acts chapter 9, Paul, he's on the way to Damascus. He's persecuting Christians. And on this way, he, he encounters Jesus Christ. And Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul doesn't know who Jesus is. But Paul has this, begins this relationship with Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 9. And his life is changed. I don't think we're all going to have the same kind of experience that Paul had. But every person who's a servant of God has experienced what Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 refers to, and that's we're saved by grace, God's grace through faith in Jesus. Here's the next word for you, what I think it looks like to be a servant of God, and that is obedient. Servants of God are obedient to what God is directing them to do. That's what happened in Acts chapter 9. Jesus speaks to him and he says this. He says, now get up and go into the city, which is Damascus, and you will be told what you must do. He was giving Paul some instructions. Would Paul obey? Thankfully for him, he obeyed the Lord. He got up with the help of others and he went into the city, starting to live a life of obedience to the Lord. Ask yourself this morning, how am I doing at living a life of obedience to what God wants me to do? Third word, third word I want to share with you this morning is character. You see in Acts chapter 9 that Paul was both hardworking and he was humble. When people in Acts wanted to try to sacrifice to him and Barnabas because they thought he was some kind of God, here's what, uh, here's what they shouted. He said, friends, we too are only human like you. We're telling you to turn from worthless things to the living God. That's humility. So don't look to us. Look to the living God. And he also talked about being hardworking so that he could help the weak as it's more blessed to give than to receive. Third, uh, a next word for you is hardship. Sometimes as a servant of God, you will go through hard things. We will go through hard things. It's not easy serving God in a fallen and in a sinful world. A number of years ago, I was teaching the book of Acts in South Dakota. And I had all those who were there break out into different groups, and I gave them different portions of Scripture in the book of Acts. And I said, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to take a look at all the ways that the early church, including Paul, went through some type of hardship or difficulty. And they started to note all these different ways and they, and they wrote them on a whiteboard. And after we were all done, the whole whiteboard was filled with different types of difficulties and hardships that the early church went through. And so we can go through hardships when we're serving the Lord, but I think we also need to balance out this teaching with other teaching. For example, from Psalm 23, think about this for a moment. Most of us probably know the psalm. Uh, King David, he writes this, how... How God would make us lie down in green pastures and lead us beside quiet waters. And David was a servant of the Lord as well. Those things weren't too difficult. So we need to balance out teaching with life being difficult for us as Christians. Let's continue to move on this morning in this message. I want to share point two with you. And so not only does abundant living involve serving the Lord... Living an abundant life also includes knowing and sharing the message of Christ with others. Continue to look here at Romans chapter 1. Take a look at verse 3 with me. I want to highlight this one verse. So a good portion of this whole section is about the life of Christ. And it says here in verse 3, Regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David. I could talk about a lot of different things about the earthly life of Christ but what I want to do this morning is I want to talk about his birth. And so if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 12. We're going to take a look at the birth of Christ. Or you can look up on the screen there. Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 12. Listen to this. It says, <clears throat> Now after Jesus was born in 
Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When, king Her- when, king- when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. He told them in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went from them until it came, over, came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So much I could talk about from this Christmas story. I could talk about the star, I could talk about Herod. But what I want to do this morning is, just in a fairly quick way, I want, I want to give you four, four applications that I think this Christmas story has for us today. Four applications for the Christmas story for us today. We're going to move through these things very quickly. And the first is this. Just like people were spiritually searching for Jesus during his birth, people are still spiritually searching today as well. You see that in the Christmas story, how people were searching. The, the wise men, they came. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Uh, Herod, he was searching for Christ, and there's different reasons why they were doing this. But I think people are still spiritually searching, including in our country. I saw this uh, recently by Barna. The CEO of Barna, his name's David Kinnaman, he, he wrote that there is a rising spiritual openness in America. And so in other words, people are increasingly spiritually searching. And he wrote this, he said, but Americans seem open to different antidotes to help make sense of life in these chaotic times. A lot of chaos going on. And so people are saying, how can we make sense of things? And so they're spiritually searching. Uh, in October of 2022, Barna, in a survey of 2,000 U.S. adults, said three out of four, or 74%, say they want to grow spiritually. Additionally, 77% say they believe in a higher power, and nearly 44% say they are more open to God today than before the pandemic. And then he goes on to write, he says, through a religious affiliation and church attendance, Continues to decline, spiritual openness and curiosity continues to increase. And I want to just read this next slide here. He goes on to say, Some of the greatest signs of hope for the church come from our recent study, the largest one to date, of teens around the world. So there's opportunity for the church to minister to teens based on their spiritual openness, he said. And he calls them the open generation and indicates that young people may be feeling this rise in spiritual hunger. Overwhelmingly, Christian teens today say that Jesus still matters to them. 76% say, (coughs) Jesus speaks to me in a way that is relevant to my life. So there are data on the rising spiritual openness in America coupled with the open generation research reveal a tremendous opportunity for faith leaders and the church, I would say, the majority of Americans has signaled that they're willing to consider exploring spirituality. They're open to more that truly satisfies. And so he ends by saying this, the challenge for the church and and for ministries, Christian ministries, is whether we are ready and able to meet the spiritually open where they are as they are, and that we have to bridge the trust gap for people 
who are spiritual but not religious. I love that last phrase. We have to bridge the trust gap. To me, that's an issue of our character. Will we walk out our Christian faith? Not just preach it. To build trust with people who need Christ. Let's move on here. I want to share the second application today. It's just like people receive some spiritual guidance from God in the Christmas story, God is still giving us spiritual guidance today. You ever think about that? God is, God is speaking to us. He's giving guidance. And I think probably the primary way that he speaks to us is through his word. I want to highlight this portion of God's word to you this morning from uh, Roman, sorry, uh, Psalms chapter 19. If you want to turn there, <coughs> or you can look on the screen. Psalms chapter 19, verse 7 through 11. God guides us as we look into his word. And here's what this one portion says. Just the, just the greatness of God's word in this passage. Listen to what it says here. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. <clears throat> The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is worn, and keeping them there is a great reward. I love Psalm 19 because it talks about all the wonderful things that God's word, including things like his law, his statutes, his precepts, etc., can give us. Look at some of the things that it says here. Refreshment. God's word can refresh us. Maybe you've been through a hard day and you just get into the word and it just refreshes you. Uh, it can give us wisdom. So in other words, we don't have to live a foolish life. We can look in God's word and we can grow in living a wise life. Uh, it can give us joy. If we're lacking in joy, we can get into it, and God will help us to have joy. It gives us light to our eyes. Uh, one thing we sometimes don't talk about in the church <clears throat> is that it gives us a warning. That God gives us warnings about how we're doing spiritually. And if people are off track, he warns us. I can remember when I was 16 years old. I was driving back from a high school volleyball game in the Grand Rapids area. I was with my friend, and we were about 15 minutes from Floodwood. And I was super tired, and the next thing I know, I remember, I was on this bankment off the road, and I woke up going 60 miles an hour. The bank was so steep, my car started to roll, not just once, but it rolled three times. And it landed right side up. I quickly climbed out of the window, the broken window. Uh, my friend, he was okay. He was trapped in the vehicle. So I went over to the other side to help him. And I managed to help him get out of the vehicle. He just had a bruised elbow. But I think about that story. If only what I had some type of a warning. Now they have these rubble strips, right? If you're going off the track, they have a rubble strip that says you got to get back in the middle of the road. Now we have cars that, that'll drive for you. If you're going out of your lane, they'll bring you back in the middle of your lane. There's all these things that warn us, right, when it comes to vehicles. And so warnings are a good thing from the Lord because... It's, he's speaking to us and saying, I want you on this track. I want you on the path that I have for you. And he's still giving warnings today. He's saying things like, Jesus is coming back. Be ready. Be watchful. Because judgment day is coming. Let's move on here this morning. Here's a third application. It's just like people found Jesus. People can still find Jesus. Or stated another way, Jesus can still find us. Jesus can find us. We can find Jesus. Look at a couple of portions of scripture. In the next slide there. One from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13. God speaking here says, You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. 
That we're not talking about religion this morning. We're, finding, we're talking about finding a personal God. Acts chapter 17, verse 27, in the New Testament, it says, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though, though he is not far from each one of us. You can find God. So many things we look for in our world today. Maybe we lose things sometimes, right? Sometimes in my household, we, we can't find certain things. So we have to look for them. And God gives us the ability to find his son. Let's go on to the fourth application this morning. From the Christmas story. Just like people worship Jesus in the Christmas story, the ultimate question each of us must answer is, will we worship Christ as well? During the Christmas season and during at all times. And so you might wonder, well, how, how can I do that? How can I worship Christ more? Think about this from this morning. If you're a husband, one way you can worship Christ during the Christmas is to love your wife. If you're a wife, one way to worship Christ is to respect your husband. For kids, worshiping God involves listening to and obeying your parents. Who are Christians. It could be stepping out of your comfort zone and, and reaching out to someone that you, you don't know, but God is leading you to do that and, and showing them love in some way. It could be helping out in church during the holiday season. Or even just maybe having a different attitude. Say, so sometimes the holiday season gets me down. I complain. I'm negative. Maybe this Christmas season you're going to say, I'm just going to be uh, I'm going to work on being in right relationship with God and not complaining during this holiday season. And maybe when it comes to our relationships, you're going to say this, I'm going to do my part so that I can experience peace in my relationships with other people because that's what God desires. I want to wrap this message up this morning by sharing my third and final main point with you. If you want to go back to Romans chapter 1, I'm going to share this final point with you from this passage And my last point there is living an abundant life involves being secure as a result of knowing our God-given identity. I once spoke to a, a group of young people. And when I started speaking to them, I took a, a, about a 12 by 12 piece of porcelain tile and about the same size of a piece of glass. And I took that porcelain tile and I, and I put that out in front of them and I said, here's what I want you to do. I had a young person come up. I gave that person a hammer and I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that hammer and I want you to hit that porcelain tile. And so he hit that piece of porcelain tile and it broke into about five or six different pieces. And then I said, I now want you to do the same thing with that piece of glass. And so I set that, leaned that piece of glass up on something and that young boy, he hit that piece of glass with his hammer and it shattered into many pieces. And I said, sometimes our, our, our identity is like that. That we have, we have a broken and we have a fractured identity. Sometimes it may not be that broken. It's like that porcelain tile. It's not very broken, but it still needs to be healed and repaired. Sometimes our identity is deeply broken. It's been shattered like that piece of glass was shattered and how God wants to heal and repair people's identities. If you look with me at verses 6 to 7, I want to I just share three things with you that I think are amazing and they're wonderful about our identity as believers in Jesus Christ. Take a look at these passages. These two verses. And the first thing is this to remember that we belong to Jesus Christ. We belong to Jesus Christ. I think there's a lot of people that want to belong to something or someone. We, we all have this desire to belong. Famous person once uh, said this. He said, I don't even remember the season. I just remember walking between a group of people, a small group of people, and starting to talk to this group, group of people. And for the first time in my life, I felt like I belonged somewhere. This morning you belong to Christ. 
as a believer. It means you're significant. Second thing this morning about our identity. And I think this is for Christians and non-Christians. We are loved by God. Verse 7 says this. It says, to all in Rome. You could say this, to all in Black Duck. Surrounding area are loved by God. God simply loves you because it's his character to love you. And the greatest demonstration of his love for you is he sent his son to die on the cross for you. Remember that he loves you in this holiday season. And then third and finally, this is for us who are believers in Jesus. We are saints. Verse 7 refers to holy people can be translated also as saints. So in God's eyes, we are no longer sinners, but we are saints. Remember this week, when you look at yourself in the mirror, to tell yourself the truth. And the truth is, is that you are a saint in God's eyes. Let's close in prayer. We're going to go into communion. And move forward with the service. God, we uh, thank you for your word that it speaks to our hearts. It helps us. It equips us for every good work. It changes us. Helps us to live this abundant life that I talked about this morning. So I just pray for each of us, Lord, that we live this life. It's an abundant life that you came to give us. In this Christmas season and during, throughout, during the times throughout the year. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, at this time we're going to have our communion service. And uh, so those of you that, from the church that can help, uh, come forward. And let's sing together this, the first uh, two verses <coughs> of Jesus Paid It All. Just remain seated and sing out, Jesus Paid It All. <coughs> We go into communion this morning. You're welcome to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll be reading, starting with verse 23. It says, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, in the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man or woman ought to examine himself or herself before he or she eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment <coughs> on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. 
But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. So the reason why we take communion, remember one reason why we take communion this morning is to remember what Christ did on the cross for us. That his body hung on the cross for us and he shed his blood on the cross for us so that we could have our sins forgiven. But it also talks about us examining ourselves before we take communion. And so let's just take some time to do that for a minute or two to examine how we're doing spiritually. And if there's something that you need to confess to the Lord, know that he can forgive, forgive it. Bible says we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's take a moment to uh, just examine our lives before the Lord and to deal with anything that we need to deal with before we take communion. I want to ask the men up front here to distribute the bread at this time. And I'd ask that you would wait to, to eat it until we all take it together after the cup has been distributed as well. We'll start with uh, the bread. Reading from, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The Bible says that these words, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Seat. like to have the men up here now to distribute the cup.
Going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, God's word says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this, whatever you drink, in remembrance of me. Let's drink right now. Can we all stand this morning? We're going to close in a word of prayer and one last hymn. Lord, we just uh, continuously put our focus on you. Your word tells us to keep our eyes fixed on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And Lord, we, we remember your birth, and not only that, we remember your death on the cross for us as we celebrate communion here today. We praise you. Uh, we worship you here today, Lord, for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Just remain standing and let's sing together then the last two verses of Jesus Paid It All. Excuse me. For nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of for the benediction. Reading from Numbers chapter 6. It says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you, give you peace. Amen. You're dismissed. Yeah, continue the fellowship in the fellowship hall. There's lots of donuts and coffee. Have a blessed week. <laughs>